Welcome to International Webinars on Gastroenterology and Arts by American College of Gastroenterology. I am Dr. Chandrasekhar, who is a governor for India region, American College of Gastroenterology. I bring warm greetings from American College of Gastroenterology and World Gastroenterology Organization as a member of scientific committee. And uh, I represent Tamil Nadu Dr. MGR Medical University. I bring warm greetings from my institution, Med India Hospital and Academy. And uh, this is a very important webinar on geriatric and pediatric gastroenterology. I just want to give you a small introduction about uh, these webinars. This is the third series webinar. And the first two series were attended by over 9,000 delegates from all over the world. And this is the success story that really inspired us to go for the further webinar. This happened during pandemic time, COVID-19. This is the third meeting in the webinar series 3, endorsed by American College of Gastroenterology, organized by Med India Hospital and Academy, accredited by Tamil Nadu Medical Council and all these hmm. are affiliated to the Tamil Nadu Dr. MGR Medical University. Now I have a pleasant task to introduce my faculty. If there are two speakers and two moderators. Dr. Sita Chakavatia is the Vice Chair, Board of Governors of American College of Gastroenterology, USA, Consultant Gastroenterology, the Valley Hospital, Ridgewood, New Jersey, USA, and served as Professor of Medicine in New Jersey. And her special interest is geriatric gastroenterology, apart from colorectal cancer screening and women's GI health. She is going to talk to us on geriatric gastroenterology, special problems and solution. And this is going to be moderated by Dr. C.S. Pichumani. I always call him as... It is a gateway to America for all the Indian doctors. He served as the Chief of Gastroenterology at St. Peter's University of New Jersey, USA. He is an author of over 200 articles and 7 books in gastroenterology. And one of the books is on geriatric gastroenterology. He has come with the second edition. Also an internationally known for his contribution in pancreatic diseases and geriatric gastroenterology. The second speaker going to be Professor Dr. Vijal Potar. He is the head of the Department of Pediatric Gastroenterology, SGPGI Lucknow. He has authored over 170 publications. He comes from my alma mater, PGA Chandigarh. He is the winner of Olympus J. Mitra Endoscopy Award by ISG, Indian Society of Gastroenterology. <laughs> He started the super specialty course in pediatric gastroenterology, firstly in India. His research area is very wide, it includes uh, celiac disease, IBD, portal hypertension, and neonatal cholestasis. And this is going to be moderated by uh, the one of the first uh, pediatric gastroenterologists of India, Dr. V.S. Sankar Narayanan. He is a former professor, head department of pediatric gastroenterology. Madras Medical College and the first recipient of uh, National Board Exam, the Emeritus Teachers Award, Lifetime Achievement Award from the MGR Medical University, and reviewer of Indian Pediatrics and Indian Journal of Pediatrics. This is going to be the whole talk after this. is going to be managed by the panelist, Professor Raghuram from Madras Medical College, with a retired uh, professor, and Dr. Asho Chokka, my good friend. And uh, he is right now working in Arvi Hospital, Vellur. He was being there. Honorary President of Indian Society of Gastroenterology, Dr. Jagannathan. He is a senior gastroenterologist from Madurai. The lecture will be moderated. I mean, we'll have the panelists. Dr. D. Nirmala, Professor, Head Department of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Institute of Childhood in Chennai, and Dr. Simati, <laughs> Consultant Pediatric Gastroenterologist, Dr. And um, this uh, was ably coordinated by my colleague, Dr. Gokul, Dr. Satyamurti, Dr. Raja Yogesh, Dr. Prasad, and Dr. TNS. And um, we have created the international and national ambassador, and they really worked very hard. 
to uh, propagate the information about the webinar uh, to the various parts of India, Dr. Chaubal, Dr. Pravin Roy, and Dr. Ramesh Kumar, Dr. Srinivas Rao, and Dr. Pravin <coughs> Kumar, Dr. Arvind Gobi, Dr. Grish, Dr. Mahapatra, Dr. Ayashish, Nirmaljit, Rajiv, and Venkat, Sahin Nazir, and Lamba, and Jain Ghosh, and Dr. Goswami, Ashish Kumar, and Arvind Kumar, and Devendra Singh. And we have International Ambassador Vivek, Chandramouli, Sitaram, Farooq Ahmad, Ajay Yiva, Rajesh, and uh, Akante, and uh, Bidan Nidhi, and Dr. Isan from Sri Lanka. Now, uh, happy news is, not only the Tamil Nadu uh, graduates and postgraduates and the consultant avail the one hour credit hour from Tamil Nadu Medical Council. Those in the other states of India also can claim. They have to report it to us in 24 hours. You get a one hour credit uh, hours, you will get it. And I want to tell you here, I must thank academic partner Microlabs for this wonderful uh, academic event they are organizing. Without their help, it would not have been possible for us. The first webinar in the third series was inaugurated by Professor Dr. Jonathan Lighton, President of American College of Gastroenterology. And after that, they took up a momentum. And uh, we have now lined up 12 international webinars from April 24 to March 25. And the fourth one, the next one is going to be a very, very important topic, biostatistics for doctors and systemic review and meta-analysis. We have international stalwarts and the August will be in celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity and October will be Barrett's esophagus and GERD and November will be in hepatology and muscle and the uh, December will be in how to colonoscopy and rate limiting steps and ERCP and uh, fecal mycobacteria and probiotics in January high quality colonoscopy and apogee endoscopy is a very, very vital topic for all the postgraduate. It's going to be in February and March going to be H. pylori infection, GA malignancy and uh, this is what. And uh, September is going to be a very, very unique and a lifetime opportunity. I always tell that we are going to have a Nobel laureate professor, Dr. Barry Marshall. He is from Australia. He is a discoverer of Helicobacter pylori. He is the which revolutionary management of peptic ulcer and stomach cancer. His topic is the journey of discovery of Helicobacter pylori. And further, I appeal to all the gastroenterologists, physicians, surgeons, postgraduate medical students, and microbiologists, pathologists, attend in large number to listen to uh, the uh, Nobel laureate. This is a very important thing. And next, I just wanted to tell you glad news. The last three webinars, we have the cumulative attendance of at uh, 6 p.m. today. 5,231 people have registered for this. Uh, this is a big achievement. This is possible because of my colleagues and national and international ambassadors. Apart from the good faculty and the nice topic, and we look forward to this. And after the two talks, we are going to have the panel discussion and question answer session. There will be a lighter se a session, a chit chat with the faculty. Know more about our faculty and their inspiring uh, journey which will be really useful to our younger colleagues and delegates. After that, we'll wind up. And now the lecture session starts now. Okay, and uh, we, are, we are going to start the first session. May I request uh, Professor C.S. Pichumani, who has been introduced to start the proceedings of the first lecture. After the second lecture, after both the lectures, we'll have the panel and question and answer. Professor C.S. Pichumani, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar. I am truly honored to be part of this symposium. You are an example of what one man can do to change the entire picture. What you have achieved through your services to gastroenterology in India is remarkable. At this time, I have to thank a number of my colleagues in India, uh, Delavari, whom I met in 1974 in Mexico for the first time, and you, I met you in 1992 at the time of World Congress of Gastroenterology, where we presented a paper. And 
Sita, I met her in 1986 when she was a resident in medicine with one of my colleagues, Dr. D'Amato, Anthony D'Amato. Dr. Chaco, I knew him very well for years. And these people are actually, they are all very dear to me. And it's an opportunity for me to meet them all, at least on a screen, if not in person. The field of Indian gastroenterology, as I remember, in 1976, when I wanted to return to India, to Chandigarh, only there were four centers in India, Chandigarh, All India Institute of Medical Science, Christian Medical College, and perhaps in Madras. And in Bombay, there were many people who claimed to be gastroenterologists. And that was the scenario at that time. And today, you have grown up so well. You have geriatric gastroenterology. You are talking about pediatric gastroenterology, endoscopy. You have grown up so well. You have reached international status at this time. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sita Chokavatya, whom I know, as I said, for close to 40 years, who has worked with me, collaborated with me. She wrote a chapter in our book, in the first edition of geriatric gastroenterology. She is an outstanding speaker with tremendous accomplishments, and I welcome her at this time to give her presentation. Thank you, Dr. Pichmoni. I'm going to try and share my screen over here and see if we can start this without any glitches. Uh, is that- I request uh, all talk? of you mute your uh, uh, the mic. Can you see me? Can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah I'm, we are able to see that. Okay, first of all, good evening, all colleagues, and thank you so very much, Dr. Chandrasekhar. Thanks to all the moderators and all the panelists. It is an absolute honor to be able to give this uh, lecture, and I thank you dearly for this invitation. Uh, you can actually take, you know, the girl out of India, but you cannot take India out of the girl. So again, very nice to meet everybody, if not uh, in person, at least virtually. And thank you, Dr. Pichmoni and Dr. Sacker, for all your uh, leaderships. I have no conflicts of interest, um, except to declare my own age as well as my mentors' ages. Both my mentors are well into their 80s, and they both are active educators. They're still very active in teaching and in research. Dr. Pichmoni is actually on his third geriatric textbook. And thank you for including me on the first one. Even though we are young at heart, I think we are classified as old because we have reached 65 years and we are over that now. The entire world is aging and the global presence of older adults from 2015 to 2050, the population of 65 and over is just booming. And if you look at Asia, there are a lot of older patients in Asia from Japan, China, India, having a large percentage of these older patients, older people. I can't call them patients because a lot of them are aging successfully. When we look at the global population of 80 plus patients, you find that there are very many patients, including 17% of the global population will be represented with octogenarians. So the presence of all these older people has been not gone unnoticed. We look at what happened, maybe because of better medical care, maybe because of decreased birth rates, but the pyramid is now turning into a pillar. And there are more and more both male and female older people. Female outnumber the males at the uh, extreme of age. And the newspapers have also taken this into account. And addition to the pillars of society, including our political leaders, we also have our religious leaders who are much older. And when we look closer to home, our aging grandparents and parents, as well as ourselves, all of us getting old, which is good because the alternative is not that great. The GI tract is great in that there are no specific GI diseases that are limited to older adults. The physiologic changes that occur, occur at all levels, and these are homeostenosis and inflammation. With homeostenosis, there's diminishing reserves, 
inability to maintain homeostasis, increased vulnerability, and a decreased physical resilience, all of which lead to what we see in the older adult with increased falls and frailty. Inflammation is older immune system. So there's a persistent low level pro-inflammatory state, increased infections, susceptibility to infections, increased malignancies and autoimmune disorders in the older adult. There are few specific changes within the GI tract. And we know that despite that, a lot of older patients and adults have GI uh, symptoms. They did a recent study on self-reported for, uh, health, and they found that the people with digestive symptoms reported a much poor quality of life as they had either decreased nutrition or diarrhea or constipation. But most of the GI problems occur because of comorbid diseases and the medications that we use for these medis- uh, diseases. The pharmacokinetics is changing and the medications have s- adverse events because of, again, homeostenosis in these pa- in these adults. A lot of the problems that we see in the older adult are commonly encountered in adult uh, patients, but the presentation is often atypical. And then, although we like to think that there are solutions, most of these are not simple and there's complex, challenging uh, patients when we look at the treatment for these patients. So let's review the age-related physiological changes that occur in the GI tract and their clinical impact. In the older adult, because of the indentulate state and altered taste in saliva, which may be from medication adverse events and muscle weakness, there is possibly the increase of transfer dysphagia, which is oropharyngeal dysphagia. And this is specifically noted in nursing home residents who may also have vascular uh, compromise with strokes, Parkinson's disease, dementia, which leads them to have increased amount of aspiration pneumonia. And sometimes a lot of these patients in long-term care are subject to gastrostomies. With the esophagus, we see dysphagia, presbyphagia, which is debated if the changes in motility are actually the cause of the dysphagia symptoms, or it's just something that occurs in older patients. Or dinophagia is pain, and most of the adult older adults present with atypical symptoms with GERD with chest pain. They often have Barrett's esophagus, and when you try to treat them with PPIs or proton pump inhibitors, we are worried about the adverse events, and the patients themselves can Google this and are concerned about the adverse events like community-acquired pneumonia, C. diff colitis, chronic renal disease, osteoporosis. They also are subject to weight loss from dysphagia and again may need enteral nutritional access with PEG or other access modalities. Further down in the stomach, patients with ulcers may present with complications because they may not sense the initial burning sensation and they present with perforated ulcers. H. pylori is prevalent in the older population, and they also have atrophic gastritis, which may put them at increased risk for gastric cancers. They have decreased gastric emptying, and therefore they may have uh, early satiety and a decreased appetite. When you look at the small intestine, there are no major changes. There's minimal villus atrophy, and there is minimal impact on absorption. However, patients may have abnormal motility from adverse effects of the medications. And so they may have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and therefore more malabsorption and malnutrition. Celiac disease may present in the older adult, although we are used to seeing it in the pediatric population, and we'll hear about it later in this hour. Patients with mesenteric ischemia can have catastrophic presentations, and they can have acute abdomens, which if not picked up early and not getting an angiogram early, may lead to major morbidity and even mortality. The older adults also often present with GI bleeds, maybe from peptic ulcers, from angiovascular dysplasias. And finally, coming down to the colon, there may be decreased propulsive activity. We know that there are changes in the microbiome and anorectal changes do occur. Diverticulosis is prevalent in the older adult, and almost half the population over the age of 60 may have diverticulosis. And this just increases as the age increases. 
Patients may have constipation and even fecal impaction, defecatory disorders. They often present with diarrhea because of the constipation or diarrhea from infectious uh, gastroenteritis. They can have fecal incontinence, diverticulitis, ischemic colitis, and again, they're subject to C. diff colitis. IBD can have a second life in older age, and patients can present in their 70s and 80s with new onset uh, inflammatory bowel disease, or sometimes patients with inflammatory disease present challenges as they age with medication management. And finally, with irritable bowel syndrome, in this age group, it truly is a diagnosis of exclusion, although most of the time we know that there are Rome criteria that are fulfilled and we can safely make the diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome. When we look at the challenges of uh, management and evaluation in the older adult, we know that most of these patients may need multifactorial uh, management. They can present with complications. And um, some of these patients, you have to get the information from not only the patient, but also just like in pediatrics from the caregiver. So there is his story, her story, and their story. Patients have delirium or weight loss as the presenting symptom. They may have frailty and malnutrition. Most of these patients are on multiple medications and they may have iatrogenic complications. And there is no one size that fits all. So when you look at the community or the long-term care facility resident, there is a different patient altogether from the hospitalized patients and then patients that have dementia. When we start with medications, we start low and we go slow. So we increase the doses based upon the uh, patient's response to the medications. The other thing that's very specific to the older adult is we look at cultural, social, financial issues. Most of these patients are on fixed incomes. And a lot of patients will not take the twice a day dose of the medication that is prescribed because they may need to pay their rents as well as buy their food. Sometimes they need to pay for their own caregiver. Uh, a lot of patients live alone, so there is loneliness and patients may look for comfort care versus curative care. So we have to address palliative care and hospice care in these patients. One of the important aspects of management is going to be life expectancy because there's chronologic age where you have a 90 year old who may be as healthy as a 50 year old that has multiple comorbidities and the physiologic or functional age may be that of a 70 year old even. We have to remember that it takes coordination of care, multidisciplinary management that can involve a geriatrician, a gastroenterology, or other specialist, maybe a cardiologist, a pulmonologist, a nutritionist, a physiatrist, someone for physical therapy. The family, friends, and neighbors play a big role in the management of patients that are elderly. So we talked about life expectancy. So the definitions we look at are lifespan or longevity, and that's a length of time a species can exist in the most optimal conditions which for the humans is anywhere up to 125 years. We should all aim for that if we live healthy and we age successfully. But the life expectancy that we actually look at is the statistical measure of the estimate of the average remaining years of life at any given age. And as a woman, I can freely state that women far outlive the men and their life expectancy at each decade is far greater than the men. So having said that, and looking at patients, I will just give a very brief presentation on two patients. The first one is an 82 year old woman who was widowed a year ago, and she's accompanied to the office visit with one of her three devoted daughters. She had a, about 10 pound weight loss over one year, which is concerning. She has difficulty swallowing solids over liquids for two weeks. She points to the mid retrosternal region as a site of pain when she swallows. And she has occasional heartburn for many years. But since it's infrequent regurgitation, she has decided because of her bone uh, health not to have anything to do with proton pump inhibitors or the newer uh, potassium uh, competitive acid blockers. She doesn't have any other symptoms. Uh, comorbidities are as stated, and she's on multiple medications. 
She has decreased the amount of wine she takes that she would drink with her husband every day with dinner. Now it's once a month when her daughters take her out for dinner and she has a glass of wine. She's rather very pleasant and there is nothing to uh, suggest that she has any chronic condition on her physical exam, excepting for an intentional tremor. She's able to swallow water as you give it to her. The most important thing when you're evaluating a patient with dysphagia is to look and uh, determine with the symptoms whether it's a transfer problem or a transport problem. So the symptoms that you look at are as listed with choking and coughing and drooling, taking multiple swallows, clearing the throat, hoarseness, aspiration pneumonias in the past, and difficulty with thin liquids. Weight loss occurs both in transfer and transit dysphagia. And with esophageal, they usually say that there is a food bolus that gets stuck, or it may be a motility problem with both dysphagia to liquids and solids. But when you look at the place where they point as the site of obstruction, most of the time, if they point at the neck, one has to think that there may be something lower down as well, specifically with patients with achalasia. And the reason we want to differentiate this is because one, it guides us in the way we approach our uh, evaluation. Because if you look at oropharyngeal dysphagia, most of this is related to neuro, uh, neurological diseases. And again, most of these diseases are commonly encountered in the older person. Parkinson's disease, sarcopenia, which is weakness, systemic sclerosis, uh, strokes, or cerebrovascular events, dementia, and multiple medical medication adverse events can all cause oropharyngeal dysphagia, especially in this older population. And then there are the structural or the mechanical causes of dysphagia. And most of the adults may have either reflux disease or pilosophagitis because of their multiple medications. They may have candidiasis or they may even have a tumor. Uh, patients can have accidental foreign body ingestion, unlike younger patients who have intentional foreign body ingestions. And there may be extrinsic compression, which occurs with vascular compromise and compression on the esophagus. Uh, this motility can be primary or secondary, and patients can have esophagogastric junction, outflow obstruction with uh, stricture formation with chronic uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. I talked earlier about presbyphagia, which is tertiary contractions that are seen in the older person. It is not supposed to cause any dysphagia, so maybe because <clears throat> of the worsening of this, they may lead to dysphagia eventually, but we don't know for sure. It's debatable. So in this patient, we actually decided to go with an endoscopy, although if it was more of an upper uh, oropharyngeal, maybe an imaging study might have been better. Uh, there are other ways of managing this, but you know, including empiric proton pump inhibitor therapy, if the patient had been so inclined to uh, accept that mode of uh, therapy or management. Endoscopy is always something that we look at uh, and wonder about the complications. But most of the time, it is a safe procedure as long as we've evaluated the risks and looked at the benefits that it would provide both for diagnosis as well as for interventions therapeutically. It's always a shared or a joint decision to proceed with any procedure or with any management plan. And we have to take into account the patients may be on anticoagulation or antiplatelet medications. Most of the complications occur not from the procedure itself, but because of the anesthesia. So it has to be very uh, carefully determined as to what we are going to use. Most of my practice includes an anesthesiologist who provides the anesthesia. So we feel pretty comfortable in doing these procedures. Uh, the increased diagnostic yield with uh, endoscopy includes not only direct visualization, but also ability to biopsy. And then, like I said earlier, the therapeutic food bolus disimpaction, esophageal dilation. If the patient has chronic liver disease and has varices, we can bind them. If there is a uh, dis high-grade dysplasia of a varus esophagus that can be ablated, or even a tumor can be ablated at some point, and palliative stents can be placed. If there was oropharyngeal dysphagia, it shows that there might be extrinsic compression either from a cervical osteophyte. Older patients with a large atrium can also have compression on the esophagus, and that was actually the way that patients di were diagnosed with large atria in the old days when 
I guess um, we were infants, maybe doing an upper GI to find out if the atrium was enlarged and then get a cardiac diagnosis. Trichopharyngeal bar, which can be due to oropharyngeal uh, dysphagia, can lead to oropharyngeal dysphagia as well as a Zenker's diverticulum, which can then cause compression on the esophagus. And then endoscopic diagnosis of erosive esophagitis, maybe even a stricture, Barrett's esophagus, and unfortunate uh, occurrence of a esophageal adenocarcinoma. When patients present with motor diseases, uh, motor disorders, one of the more common ones being an achalasia, either a imaging study or endoscopy where you have to insufflate to open the lower sphincter and pretty much like you do with the younger adult, you make the diagnosis and then treatment may be related to Botox injections if the patient cannot undergo surgery. So again, it's a palliative measure of sorts, but you can be Botox injection to these patients. And then Schatzky's ring, which can occur above a hiatal hernia and can be dilated in patients. These patients usually are referred to as a steakhouse syndrome where they take a big solid piece of meat and then it gets stuck at the junction uh, with the Schatzky's ring. And then endoscopically, you might even see eosinophilic esophagitis in adults, older adults that have dysphagia. Although more frequently, we look at uh, looking for candida esophagitis when they have odinophagia or retrosternal burning, which is often attributed to GERD, and patients are given proton pump inhibitors for acid suppression, and then this gets worse. So maybe an endoscopy may not be such a bad idea in these patients. We just submitted uh, esophageal ectopic sebaceous gland to the ACG as a clinical vignette. And this was a 70-year-old man that had a four-dye spot, which looked very much like either a, um, uh, a candida or maybe CMV. And on biopsy, came back as a ectopic sebaceous gland. And this over here is the glycogenic acanthosis, which we see very commonly, which is very benign and often doesn't need a biopsy even. This patient was finally diagnosed as pill esophagitis, and there were so many clues because she had been taking antibiotics, she had been taking ibuprofen because of the tooth pain. And patients which who are put on potassium chloride or, or maybe some form of uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for pain or antibiotics or sometimes alendronate can have retention of these pills at the sites of um, you know narrowing that is normal. And then because of decreased esophageal clearance or decreased salivary, uh, you know, salivation or swallowing, they may have inadequate fluid bolus and they take a lot of these pills lying down and multiple pills simultaneously. One of my patients was very proud that he was able to take 10 pills without taking any fluids and he took it at night. So uh, something that we really don't want to encourage. We try and tell them to swallow one pill at a time, take a water bolus or liquid bolus every pill and do it in an upright position. You can substitute suspension formulations such as for potassium instead of the pills. And then for a short term, not forever, one might try healing with a proton pump or acid suppressant newer medications. And then obviously doing anti-reflux um, interventions like not lying down for at least three hours after every meal might also be of help. So that is for the upper end and then moving on to the next, the lower part, uh, although there are so many organs in between and the, I was told that I had to stay on time and finish within half hours, so I will try and do my best to keep it top and bottom. Um, it's a 76 year old man who came to the office with his wife now. Um, for lifelong constipation, he was a retired lawyer and therefore knew everything about everything. He tried everything, every laxative and every prescription medicine that he was given and nothing had worked. He reported heart stool with straining and defecation, unusual maneuvers to evacuate, occasional digitation and no rectal bleeding. Um, he did not have any pain and he had recent increased urinary frequency, nocturnal symptoms, getting up frequently to urinate. A colonoscopy a year ago showed pan-colonic uh, diverticular disease. 
Uh, I did not have gray hair all my life. So uh, when a 70 year old man came in and he looked at my petite figure, it was difficult to convince them that maybe, just maybe, I might have some extra insight into what was going on. So eventually trying to convince them that they should get a digital rectal exam, which revealed a heart feces in the rectum. Now, he did have some mild degree of dementia, so the dyssynergic defecation suggested by an increase in sphincter tone on attempted defecation may not be the correct um, you know, assessment at this point. What is really important is to do the rectal exam, and because you have to tell the patient why you're doing it, and then kind of go over why you and how you're going to do it, helps in allaying their fears and, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, problems that they might encounter by just having somebody uh, stick a finger where they really don't want anybody to examine them. And this is especially true of the older uh, gentleman. Uh, it's very important to try and see if you can determine if there is a problem with defecation itself. So you have to ask them to strain and then you evaluate the pelvic floor for descent and relaxation of the external sphincter and the puborectalis. And if the contraction of the external inner sphincter on attempted defecation tells you that maybe, just maybe, there is dyssynergia. If there is blood on the examining glove, it may be misleading because uh, this is sometimes traumatic. Patients may have hemorrhoids and therefore the occult blood test may be positive. However, you do check for solid stool, which this patient had. When we look at defecation, we find that patients most of the time can have co uh, constipation either from delayed transit or normal transit, or there may be defecatory disorders. So normally, the, once we get up in the morning, most of us have our cup of tea, chai, coffee, hot water, and that initiates a gastrocolic reflex, which results in high amplitude propagated contractions, a mass movement in the colon, which deposits the stool in the rectum and causes distension of the rectum, which there is an anal, uh, anal inhibitory uh, reflex, which then causes the internal anal sphincter to relax. And if you're sitting on your throne at home and this appropriate environment, there is relaxation of the external anal sphincter and the puborectalis, straightening of the anorectal angle, descent of the pelvic floor, and with straining and increased intra-abdominal pressure, defecation is facilitated with a squatty position and the uh, now popularity of a squatty potty, which is available online and you can order it on Amazon because most of us still like to use the, you know, uh, commode. The inappropriate environments, uh, defecation is differed by contraction of the levator ani, puborectalis, and the external sphincter if these muscles and the nerve supply to them is intact. However, if there are problems, especially with the older uh, adult, there may be incontinence. And so this is just a cartoon of the anatomy of continence. No talk on constipation would be complete without having the next four slides, which is definition of functional constipation and irritable bowel syndrome and the Rome 4 criteria for this, which most of us that take care of adult patients and pediatric patients are familiar with, so I will not go over them. And then the Bristol stool scale, which can correlate with intestinal transit. And a lot of times patients do bring in pictures of their stool with the iPhone and the Android phones. It's very easy to click pictures every day for the week, for the month. And a lot of times the appointment duration is rather filled with looking at shots of their stool which sometimes helps in determining if they actually had multiple loose stools or it was actually constipation and pellets, which some of my patients call sheep droppings or rabbit pellets. We know that frequency is not the most common and in adults, we can have anorexia, weight loss, diarrhea, delirium, urinary um, incontinence or infection as their presentation. And there's a long list of secondary causes of constipation, which again is the um, secondary causes may be prevalent in the older patient. So a lot of these, especially the drugs and the neurological uh, diseases, 
may contribute to constipation, secondary constipation in the older adult. We talked about the atypical presentation in these patients. And it's important to remember when the patients say that they have diarrhea and incontinence, it actually may be fecal impaction and overflow incontinence, again, highlighting the importance of doing a rectal exam. Patients may have rectal pain and bleeding from either a solitary rectal ulcer or a prolapse of the rectum or hemorrhoids or fissures. And some of them may have rectocele, which may press upon the rectum and cause constipation. Patients may have obstruction, pain, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, uh, altered mental state, and we mentioned the others. So to not to be repetitive, but it is very important to get that history from the patient and the caregiver. Talk about digital maneuvers. Do the patient have to put their fingers in to remove the stool? Do they have to press upon the perineum? Sometimes with the women, they have to press inside the vagina to maintain de uh, defecation intact. Look at the diet and activity. Make sure they're not ignoring the call to stool and review the medications. Previous surgical history, obstetric history, injury to the perineum, emotional psychological factors and fecal incontinence all have to be inquired after. It's when you talk about diet, it is known that a lot of busy gastroenterologists do not have the time to elicit a dietary history. Um, obviously, a lot of the patients that I see do not have teeth, and this would be very hard for them to eat the corn that is uh, picturized over here. They have impaired mobility, and they're unable to a get their own food, prepare their food if they have instrumental activities of daily living impaired and they lose taste and uh, smell. So then they do not have an appetite. They do not have the ability to chew. There is something known as anorexia of aging and depression, which again, decreases their appetite. I just put this uh, kind of fun fact as to adults that should get 35 grams of fiber, how many apples, bananas, prunes, kiwis they should eat to try and get that fiber amount every day. We talked about polypharmacy and geriatrics, but it's also important to remember that some patients may have had diarrhea and they were prescribed antidiarrheal medications and somebody forgot to take it off their list of medicines. And so they may still be taking antidiarrheals, imodium and lumodal, which actually might be the cause of the constipation and not the other medications. When you look at the diagnostic test, there are many to uh, evaluate chronic constipation, but in the older adult, most will not require extensive uh, evaluation. Our patient already had the colonoscopy, had diverticulosis. One of the tests that can be done is a plain x-ray to see if there's a fecal stool load in the colon. And the other test is a, a radio opaque marker study, which can sometimes determine if there is slow transit or if there's a lot of stool that's uh, markers that are stuck in the pelvis. And so then it denotes an outlet problem and patient has dyssynergic defecation. The treatment has to be individualized based upon patient's cognition, ambulation, whether they're hospitalized and they can be subject to getting enemas or long-term care facility residents where the nurse may provide care. It's very important to uh, reinforce timed defecation, which goes a long way in getting patients to get regular in their bowel movements. So I have this over here for the older um, attendees, I guess, although I've never used this. And then there is an Android and an iPhone 17 that tells us that these patients actually have apps on their phones that can remind them of what they need to take, the medications, and not just, you know, uh, rely on the pill box. It's important to remember to answer the call. Do not postpone defecation. Uh, use that gastrocolic reflex, and therefore you try and time it after that. I would, not, I would be remiss if I didn't mention fecal incontinence, which impacts quality of life. And the global prevalence is one in 12 per people over the age of 60, women more than men. There was a recent man, uh, article on this in clinical gastro and hepatology just this month. Um, there are urge incontinence, passive incontinence, and fecal seepage. We know that patients do not usually volunteer this information, so it has to be elicited from the patient and the caregiver who might just report that the patient is having diarrhea or the patient himself or herself might be embarrassed and may not say it. They're embarrassed to talk about their bowel habits, unlike their last uh, stent or their cabbage, 
because cardiology is uh, probably, you know, more sexy, I guess, than gastroenterology, although we want to try and make gastroenterology, which is kind of the life uh, blood of our patients, where you get up in the morning, you have to eat, you have your lunch, you have your afternoon tea, and then the midnight snack sometimes. Um, patient care for the gastroenterologist in taking care of the older patient is really very important. We have to provide age-appropriate care, manage their mobility, mind, medications, multiple complexities, and most important, remember what matters most to our patients. Uh, comprehensive history involving the caregivers is important. Address geriatric syndromes with the geriatrician or their primary care. Look at their falls, depression, dementia, delirium, pressure ulcers, which can get worse if the patient has a fecal incontinence and urinary incontinence. Address polypharmacy. Always go through the list of the medications so there are medicines that can be discontinued or may be substituted. Uh, pharmacoequity is something else that was recently an article on patients with inflammatory bowel disease and not having equal access to the most recent medications because they are on Medicare in the US. And then iatrogenic complications from procedures, the sedation risks. It is geriatric, geriatric patient care can be complex and time consuming, but this goal is successful aging. So if we do not age successfully, as Dr. Rupichmani will point out, we definitely can promote successful aging with our interventions. It is important to have a geriatric curriculum. And uh, Dr. Leipzig from Mount Sinai, a geriatrician, had an article where she said, keeping granny safe on July 1st, which is when medical students start taking care uh, as medical residents of the new patients that they're seeing. And there are minimal competencies that these students should have to be able to take care of their older patients. So again, I thank you all for your attention. On behalf of the American College of Gastroenterology, I invite all of you to the annual meeting in Philadelphia this October, and I look forward to seeing you in person in Philly. Again, Dr. Chandrasekhar and moderators and the coordinators, panelists, uh, much appreciated this uh, opportunity and thank you for your attention. I will turn off my uh, slides. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chakrabartia. You covered 140 chapters of my three volumes book in one hour. It is amazing. Thank you very much. Now, before I open the forum to the audience for asking questions, can you hear me, all of you? Dr. Chandrasekhar, can you hear me? Dr. Pichumani, we will yes. take up the second lecture, then we will be open for all that. But I will just make one comment and then... Yeah, yeah you can be... make a comment okay. and wind up. One comment. Mm -hmm. Many of you in India okay. may or may not know the word geriatrics come from the Sanskrit root. Dr. Chandrasekhar, do you... Are you aware yeah, of yeah, it? Yeah, I am listening. The, the geriatrics word is Sanskrit. It is jara. Jara is a Sanskrit word which means brittle decay to be cons consumed it is it has a vedic origin but if you look at google you may not find this root but in other places it is mentioned geriatrics comes from the sanskrit word jara and also i would like to point out one more thing the word elderly is to be avoided today the geriatric society says don't call a person elderly there are not many better terms. People still use the word elderly. But an older adult is the term that geriatricians use, not the word elderly. In my younger days, when I was a resident, my colleagues used to describe their patients, an 85-year-old, senile old man, mentally uh, <laughs> retarded. You know, such, a terms, such a terms, adjectives are to be avoided. Today, we will say an 85-year-old older adult has mental problems of undetermined etiology. That is the way we will say. 
with due respect to the older adult. The self-realization came not because I am in that age group. The society <laughs> feels that we should be respectful to the older adults. Then only we will be able to make proper diagnosis. Otherwise, we are condemning the older people to the waste paper basket. With that, I will invite the next speaker to start. Uh, thank you, Professor Pichumini. I think during the panel discussion, we'll have more opportunity to yes, discuss. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Sita, you made a wonderful presentation. You were highlighted that it's not only a, a science managing old people, it's an art also. Now I'll uh, invite uh, Dr. Sankar Narayanan to start the proceeding for the second lecture. Then after the lecture, we'll go for the panel discussion. Thank you, Dr. Chandra Singh. Sankarnan, you are not audible. Unmute. Please unmute yourself, Dr. Sankarnan. Sorry, sorry. Ah. Am, I, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, now you are audible. Ah, right. See, the topic itself is of very much interest to both pediatrics and adults. Thanks to Dr. Chandra Sekar and his team and organizers for inviting me to be associated as a moderator. Those adults, particularly adult gastroenterologists, it may be an information. Pediatric does not mean it is up to 12 years in India. It is supposed to be from fetus to 18 years. Adolescents from 10 years to 18 years. Then comes young adults middle-aged, older people, very old people, all those things to you. Pujal border is supposed to give us maximum information how these childhood diseases can confine to pediatric age group, certain diseases can go on to adults also. This topic I have been launching, launching to discuss and requested many, many conferences. Thanks to Dr. Chandrasekhar for probably highlighting this aspect. And I request Dr. Ujjal Poder, who is a very good speaker. He is always very clear cut in his mind and life. And child is not the miniature of adult. Dr. Poderji, Thank you. please come and just help us to enlighten and enrich our knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. At the onset, I must thank Dr. Chandrasekhar for giving me this opportunity to be a speaker in this international web series on gastroenterology. And I must thank Dr. Shankar Narayanan for his generous introduction. What I have been asked to give a, a presentation titled is Child is Not the Miniature of the Adult. Now, uh, Obviously, the child is not a miniature form of adult. When you see a patient, whether it is an adult, child, or geriatric, what comes to your mind? What could be the etiology? There are three things we think. Is it the congenital or genetic cause? Is it inflammatory or it is neoplastic? As an adult gastroenterologist, always your mind is to just think about neoplastic, which you don't see. In pediatrics, on the contrary, we see more often congenital and genetically predisposed condition. Obviously, inflammatory pathology uh, is there all, all over the age. Now, this has been recognized that pediatric gastroenterology is unique and not equivalent to adult gastroenterology. That's why our body, National Medical Council, Australian Medical Council of India, has recognized a degree on pediatric gastroenterology. We have in our official three years DM course in pediatric gastroenterology, started first time in our institute in SDPJ 2011, later on in PGI Chandigarh, AMCCK, and recently in Institute of Childhood Chennai as well. 
Not only that, we have three years BM pediatric hepatology course running in ILBS. So all these things support that yes, pediatric gastroenterology has become mature enough, and it is not equivalent to adult gastroenterology only. Now the pro problem for me, Dr. Chandrasekhar has asked me to give a presentation of this three-year curriculum in 30 minutes. So it is really a Herculean task. So what I thought. I have taken the two factors to decide what I should discuss in this forum. Firstly, the time, obviously, the 30 minutes. You cannot discuss whole pediatric gastroenterology in 30 minutes. And secondly, is the relevance to this audience. I guess the majority of the audience for today's session is adult gastroenterology. So what I thought, I'll segregate the entities in three groups. Firstly, these are unique to children, unique to pediatric gastro probably is not relevant to this audience as the adult gastroenterologist. You will never think of handling a neonate with biliary atresia. You will least bother about treating an infant with metabolic liver disease. Cow's milk protein allergy is seen only in smaller kids, less than three years, which the more of a functional gastroenterologist reflects that, reflects disease which you see, and toddler's diarrhea or functional diarrhea. These are unique things but mostly irrelevant to adult gas. Secondly, the entities which may are unique, but somewhat relevant, like functional pain abdomen or recurrent abdominal pain, which is more often than what uh, Dr. Sita was highlighting, IBS or non-ulcer dyspepsia, which is seen more often in the older children, adolescent age. And pediatric NFLD or MSLD may have some relevance and some uh, uniqueness in children. But what I thought the most unique and most relevant to this audience. You do see heaps of uh, children with ESPGO. They are managed both by pediatric gastroenterologists and adult gastroenterologists. So what is unique about ESPGO in children? Then second is chronic hepatitis B, a subset which is seen predominantly in children is immune tolerant uh, chronic hepatitis B. And thirdly, IBD. IBD is a buzzword. But now among the IBD, there is a subset called monogenic IBD which is seen uniquely in children. So in next uh, 25 minutes or so, I am going to discuss this three entity and I will try to give you a message which might help you in your day-to-day -day practice. So let's start with portal hypertension in children. Obviously, all the studies from Chandigarh, Delhi and Bellore, it is EHPBO, which is the commonest cause of portal hypertension in children. On the contrary, if you see the literature from the West, in children, it is cirrhosis. Like in adults, you see commonest cause of portal hypertension. Cirrhosis in the West is cirrhosis. But it is EHPBO in India in children. Now, what is the etiology? We talk about this umbilical sepsis, umbilical catheterization, dehydration, trauma, congenital, but hardly around 5 to 10 percent cases you get this story. Majority, 80 to 90 percent of EHPBO, we don't get any etiology. It is mainly the idiopathy. But there is a lot of discussion about what about hypercoagulable state, which is one of the common cause of extra hepatic portal valve obstruction in adults. Let's, let's see the literature. So what can happen? Either there is an excess of procoagulant factor or deficiency of anticoagulant. That will lead to the thrombosis. So we can assume there is a portal valve thrombosis because of this. Do we have any information? Yes. Dr. Yacha from my institute has published a series of 19 children where he has looked at the reduction of anticoagulants like protein C, protein S, antithrombin C, and he showed the 42% of children with EHPV, they have this deficit. Study from France showing 50% of them have protein C, protein S, or antithrombin C deficiency. However, none of them had parents positive. That means these are not inherited, maybe decrease production because of the low flow. Now, do we have evidence to say this is because of the flow-related problem or shunting uh, causing increased clearance or excess consumption of this propagulant factor? Yes. Now, this is measure shunt I am going to talk about in detail. There is a series which showed that 11 patients underwent measure shunt. 10 of them had the protein C, protein S deficiency before shunt. One year after shunt surgery, 9 of them, these values return to normal. That means if you can restore the flow to the liver, then natural, uh, this uh, anticoagulant will be synthesized again. 
on the contrary if it is a shunting of the blood which causing the uh, problem then obviously the the, the usual shunt like proximal peroneal shunt the same thing they have shown there is a further reduction of protein so that substantiate that what we get in eh video of protein c proteinase or antithrombin c anticoagulant deficiency are mainly either flow or shunt related not in it now what about the procoagulation state like what we call anticoagulation and procoagulation is another series from my institute is the pgi of 49 children of ehpbo we did the molecular test to look at inherited factor 5 leiden or prothrombin gene mutation none of them had this mutation now second issue about the myeloproliferative disorder it is a acquired over or occur a myeloproliferative disorder one of the common cause of protalgen thrombosis in adults now we have a study from kings college in pediatric ehp so they have looked at jack 2 b617f mutation and none of those ehp children has got this mutation so what does it mean neither hereditary nor acquired procoagulation disorder plays any role in children of ehp it has got connotation in the management that i am going to come so the latest babino 7 recommendation said in adults whether the patient has underlying prothrombotic state or not you are supposed to treat this patient with long term anticoagulant however they said in children no they are available to recommend this so the treatment of ehp in children we don't use anticoagulation that is different from the ad now how do they present all these uh, children predominantly gi very cell bleeding 80 to 90% of them however the outcome is very good the death due to bleeding is less than 5% so what we are doing so far i am very happy to see dr dilavari in the audience so he taught us the uh, gastroenterology as well as pediatric gastroenterology in uh, 90s when i was doing the training this 90% children they are coming with bleed so what was our priority as a gastroenterologist at pediatric gastroenterology at endoscopy to control the bleed control went for pericel eradication and as a result we got a huge of publication publication on use of radiotherapy publication in the band ligation publication of combination of ebl plus est but have we look back and see what happened to those innocent kids now as i said mortality is uncommon so all of become adult now they develop all the other issues what are the issues growth failure bleeding from ectopic varices portal hepatitis biliopathy colopathy massive splenomegaly giving rise to infarction hyperplasism uh, uh, poor quality of life so now focus has started shifting from varix to other aspects so Correct. Now, question is that can you offer something which can cure this condition? What we are doing so far was palliative care. We are patient came with bleed. We are doing EST able, but we are not paying attention to the underlying disease. So now has come the buzzword is now mesorection. So the paradigm of late the paradigm has shifted as per the management of EST video from endoscopy. to surgery that also considering surgery up from this mesorection which restore the physiology of, of portal flow you anastomose the superior mesenteric vein to the left branch of the portal vein and it has been shown after the long term effect of eh video whatever the growth failure synthetic defect shunt related issues hyper everything got corrected with this shunt so what is this shunt this is the cartoon showing what this mesorection is you take a graft actually internal jugular vein and put it connect it in the superior mesenteric vein and left branch of the portal vein in that way you are restoring the blood flow so technical feasibility is not always possible we need to have hepatology report 2020 see what we have suggested when a child is coming is people with variceal bleed yes you need to control the bleed do endoscopic therapy Clero therapy, band ligation, whatever you feel like. However, simultaneously start evaluating this child. Is this child is a fit candidate for shunt? Because that is the answer to the primary disease. If the reaction is possible, offer the reaction. And remember, younger is the child, the more successful it is. 
if you keep this child on get esp evl follow up and maybe after 10 years 15 years on him feel he has developed massive spleen total bilioplasty now you need to shunt you may not get a shuntable anatomy so evaluate, evaluate early and the shunt may not be successful at all, uh, also so if the shunt is not visible then these are the patient who are esophageal very few control even after controlling they can be rebleed re or recurrence you consider uh, conventional shunt gastric varix you can control with flu but again we consider shunt as the optimum therapy for gastric varix psg can be controlled by apc beta blocker but again shunt ectopic varix same portal bilopathy growth failure hyperplasia so what is the ultimate result you need to think about shunt up front versus endotherapy and wait and work policy don't wait for this child to earn a shunt that used to be the policy but with this advent of new mesorection we need to consider this shunt up front rather than waiting for the patient to develop a catastrophic complication like bilopathy which all of you as adult gastroenterologists said were dear to handle now next topic is about the root of hepatitis b we in india believe as a adult the commonest root of transmission is parietal not perinatal however in the all over the world if you see the perinatal transmission is responsible for hepatitis b transmission in 50% of the cases and we have the clinical studies to say in pediatric age group our study from hgpgi gbpon study in children of chronic hepatitis b 60% are in immune tolerant phase and majority of the same has mother being positive so how to prove it that immune to, uh, that uh, transmission is basically mother to baby we have published this series we have done the molecular testing the pair sample the mother and the child we have uh, taken 25 such pairs and we constructed the phylogenetic tree to finding the sequence homology so what we got predominantly in the north india we got the genotype a around 40% d around 60% and if you see the concordance it is 96% 24 out of 25 children has got the similar genotype with the mother and baby so that's not the only proof now we have drawn the phylogenetic tree and this phylogenetic tree is showing the mother baby pair has got identical sequence that means all these children they got the infection from the mother so at least in children in india we have a proof to say that perinatal transmission is the dominant mode of transmission now what happened to this per perinatal transmission means majority will go into the immune tolerant phase so what is the natural history do should we treat them so they should they do they follow a benign course ideally they should be treated because to cut short the risk of hcc the risk of hcc is much higher in uh, immune tolerance than immune clearance uh, the perinatal transmission than horizontal and then prevent the spread of infection and psychological trauma but biggest problem is they don't respond to our standard therapy of nucleoside analog mainly because their cytotoxic t cell are hyperactive and that is mainly because of the high viral perinatal transmission with huge load of virus and that causes the unresponsiveness of teeth but we have the studies both in vitro and in vivo studies that showed if you can reduce the viral load by antiviral drugs like lamivudin then this t cell start responding so that is the phase when you can use the immune modulator to push this t cell to eliminate the virus so we did this study to show that uh, cure of immune tolerant hepatitis b by sequential combo therapy what we did first two months we have given the lamivudin 3 mg per kilo and then we added interferon to that over uh, the next 44 week and we have this not only our study the study from king's college the first one then our study then we study from china all these studies using the similar protocol give the two months of uh, nucleoside analog and then to add uh, uh, interferon we showed the hbs will loss almost 20 to 22% huge number no other uh, treatment can give rise to this much of figure however there is a study 
randomized trial from Canada and US. They have used entecapine instead of lamb and pegylated interferon, and they showed this figure is just around seven percent. So, what does it mean? Is it the end of the story? Of course not. Now we have got the loads of publication coming from China, published in very good journal to show that if you treat the younger patient, they do better. So this is the long-term efficacy and safety of pegylated interferon. Uh, uh, in HBC positive chronic hepatitis B, this is from Kanming, China, 118 children, and they have treated with pegylated interferon to A for 52 weeks, and then they followed for another two years. And if you see the uh, population, majority of them have immune tolerance. 72% had very low ALT, very high DNA, and 80% had mother positive. So they have immune tolerant hepatitis B. Now see the figure. The, we are not talking about the seroconversion. HBSG loss at the end of 52 weeks of peg interferon therapy is almost 50%. And it is durable. 94% is the durability. What they found, if you have a lower ALT value, what we are fixed about is, we talk about immune tolerance, immune tolerance by taking whether 60 or 80, whatever is the uh, uh, cut-up, and then you decide whether to treat or not. This study is showing if you have the lower ALT, they have a better chance of functional cure. And obviously, the younger is the age. The next study, again from China, Beijing, clinical predictor of functional cure in children, younger is 1 to 6 years of age, 236 children. Between 1 to 6 years, they have given three different combinations of interferon and interferon plus lamivudine. And, what they, and they have treated for 144 weeks. See the result that we are talking about HBCG loss at the end of 144 weeks. Interferon monotherapy has given 1% and combination therapy interferon plus lamity 70%. HBCG loss in 1 to 3 years age group is almost 80%. Phenomenal figure compared to when you are talking about the older, relatively older, like 5 to 7 years of age, it is 42%. So, and the base result is combination therapy. So they said you should consider the younger children for therapy. Then another is the functional cure is associated with younger age in children undergoing antiviral therapy for active chronic hepatitis. These are all immune clearance. They have a elevated ALT more than 60. Again, they have used the three different regimen, mainly interferon regime. And what they have shown the functional cure is basically loss at 36 months. In one to three years, age group is 62% compared to just 1.6%, the usual figure. When in an adult, you use the anti any antiviral therapy, you get this 1% to 2% age basis loss. So, see the difference between if you treat a child less than seven years, one to seven years, 50% chance of getting age basis clearance versus just 12.9% more than seven years. So, they, they didn't stop here. They have gone beyond this one year. Now they are targeting the infant less than one year. This is a real world prospective cohort study of infant less than one year who has the elevated enzyme and very high DNA. 18 of them they have treated with lamivudin alone for till one year, and another 11 they treated interferon lamivudin after one year. And they see the phenomenal result. At the end of 12 months, almost more than 80% has got. Uh, 83% has got HBC clearance, but in, with the combination of interferon, it is just 36%. So, infant, if you can pick up a baby in less than one year, lamb therapy itself can be a cure for hepatitis B. So, what is the summary? In India, at least in children, we have a predominant uh, mode of transmission is perinatal, and we know that most of these perinatally acquired hepatitis B are immune tolerant phase and they have non responsive uh, T cell, but it is possible to convert this non responsive to the responsive while reducing the uh, viral load. But what is the message I want to give? There is a window of opportunity to treat a child with hepatitis B. Catch them young, whether it is immune tolerant, whether it is immune clearance. Don't go into the debate how much is the ALT. Start treatment 
as young as possible less than 6 years preferably between 1 to 3 years and with interferon based therapy i have given this caption tiger abhi bhi zinda hai you people have discarded interferon but in children whatever study we have interferon based therapy is showing a wonder by showing functional cure in more than 80 percent of cases so last topic is about inflammatory bowel disease so inflammatory bowel disease you see more often than we do but pediatric inflammatory bowel disease we categorize them in different category as per their age of onset there is a entity called very early onset ibd when the onset is before 6 years of age we call is very early onset ibd it is around 4 to 15% of all pediatric age. not very common among them if the onset is in the first two years we call it infantile onset ibd if it is the neonate means first one month then we call it neonatal ibd now what is the importance of this very early onset ibd you know there is a entity called monogenic very early onset ibd normally inflammatory bowel disease is a polygenic disease there are more than 250 single nucleotide polymorphism is discovered by genome wide association but by isolating asnp you cannot put the blame on that particular asnp on the contrary around 15 to 20% almost a fifth of very early onset ibd they are monogenic monogenic means single gene mutation by whole exome sequencing it has been shown more than 75 of such mutation has been uh, reported in this subset of patient so but remember very early onset ibd is not synonymous with monogenic 80% they behave like ibd in older children or adults only 20% what is the uniqueness about this monogenic very early onset ibd usually they present very early means in infantile i said in the first two years of life normally they have colonic phenotype often they have perianal disease and fistulizing disease they are very aggressive disease. they don't respond to your conventional therapy not even biological and there is high risk of lymphoventricular malignancy in this patient and a proportion of them a significant proportion of them can be cured by hematopoietic stem cell transplantation this is the most important method now basically monogenic ibd is due to the two kind of uh, thing one is either there is a uh, disorder or alteration of the immune system or there is epithelial barrier function epithelial barrier function defect you will not be able to cure but the disorder which put into the immune system they are hematopoietic stem cell transplant can cure the underlying condition so what are the immune disorder you get immune dysregulation commonly you talk we talk about il10 receptor mutation or ipex syndrome immune deficiency various kind of immune deficiency common uh, problem of phagocytic defect like uh, cgd or hyperinflammation autoinflammation these are also seen in young adult like xiap uh, x link inhibitor of uh, apoptosis familiar hls etc now the how to diagnose monogenic ibd so obviously you to do a molecular testing there are three kind of molecular testing we can do the targeted testing means a panel of uh, mutation you look for it around 40 or you go for whole exome sequencing or whole gene sequencing but the problem in india is that it is a expensive test actually the uh, uh, in resource constrained country like india we need to see whether can we do all patient molecular testing or can you look for it in a high risk patient now the yield of this exome sequencing is just 3% if you unselectively take all pediatric ibd and there is a study from canada published recently they did uh, whole exome sequencing in 1005 children with ibd they got just 3% are monogenic ibd on the contrary when you are become selective high risk i this patient means the early onset ibd refractory ibd then the yield become very high 32% hence it is important to find out the subset of very early onset where exome sequencing is going to help so we did publish this study last year of looking at the monogenic ibd in our center 
over 11 year uh, period we followed this protocol and this protocol should be followed in day to day practice when you are suspecting monogenic ibd what you will do first you don't go for exome sequencing immediately go for basic immunological test like you do the nephrometry for immunoglobulin assay lymphocyte count etc you do the neutrophil oxidative function to be uh, diagnose the cgt and then do advanced immunological testing like flow cytometry to see the lymphocyte subset and we got all this in the protein etc next go for uh, next generation sequencing either targeted or whole exome in this 11 years we have seen 200 children out of which 48 of them are very early onset ibd now we could diagnose in this period 15 monogenic ibd among the very early onset and we compare them with non monogenic what we showed that very younger age Uh, 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 like seven months versus eighteen months in monogenic neonatal IBD, perianal fistula, history of consanguinity, sleep day. These are common in monogenic, uh, uh, and that can differentiate monogenic from non-monogenic IBD. And you can take this subset of children for mutation study. So now the standard of care for very early onset IBD is mutation analysis. But if the resource is constrained. then we can use this clinical parameter to decide whom to take uh, get the more, uh, mutation analysis done so take home message about monogenic very early on ibd when the onset is past 6 years of life it is around 20% of them are monogenic IBD. a variety of disorder mainly comprise of alteration of the immune system and epithelial barrier function give rise to monogenic ibd and you need to do the exome sequencing which has become a standard of care in developed countries for all very early onset ibd however when resource is an issue then concentrate on neonatal onset or infantile onset predominantly chronic disease with perianal fistula or ibd undifferentiated and refractory treatment think about getting a mutation analysis done because remember this is the only ibd which can be cured through hematopoietic stem cell transplant if you can find out a mutation suggestive of uh, immune related disorder thanks for your patience thank you dr porder <clears throat> it is a very comprehensive coverage within the short period the most common things that i would like to contribute some more which may confine to probably the where we are more worried about the mother and the baby and also we are more worried which are what are the diseases that can go on from pediatric to adult please reserve me at the end i may try to contribute a little more thank you uh, thank you uh, sir actually uh, the 12 webinars we designed this webinar little uh, because we see the extremes of age is vulnerable very very difficult to manage them both geriatric and pediatric so i thought of bringing both together in under one roof and majority of the uh, my colleagues adult gastroenterology will be benefited that is the idea having that now we have a panel discussion question answer session first i'll go with the panelist I'll ask one by one. The panelist would like to ask questions to the, or you want to contribute the form of comment or question. After the moderator will wind up, then the questions from the we have around forty to fifteen. We have selected that uh, from the um, audience also. The last twenty minutes will keep it for the chit chat session. We have solid thirty five minutes. Let me start with the doctor Asok Shakur. Uh, yes, Chandrasekhar, um, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are audible. I'd like to make a small comment. This is just a data point. I looked uh, at our patient load in the outpatient load, and uh, just to see how much of pediatric patients we see. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised to see it is very similar to the data the doctor Sita showed. We are about thirteen percent of our outpatients. were about 65 uh so that is one and the common conditions that we saw were constipation was the most common 
followed by chronic liver disease, mainly the NAFLD variety, and third was uh, GERD. And then, of course, uh, smaller numbers of the others. Now, coming to uh, first, let me congratulate Dr. Sita for a very thorough, uh, very, very thorough uh, coverage of uh, geriatric gastroenterology in half an hour. Uh, I have two or three uh, clinical uh, questions to ask her. One of the problems that I often face when I see older patients is polypharmacy because they see uh, they've got multiple comorb comorbidities. They see lots of doctors who look only at their own speciality and prescribe. So there is something sometimes duplication of medicines. There are interaction between one medicine and another. So is there any uh, protocol that she follows in de-prescribing when uh, patients come to her? Thank you, Dr. Chako. That was uh, very kind. Um, a half hour for a textbook that Dr. Pichumani has edited times twice over was a challenge, but I was trying to do what Dr. Chandrasekhar had uh, assigned to me. So I'm actually, you know, impressed that you were able to pull up the data so quickly. And it is true, we see a lot of constipation and GERD in our patients as well. And I think we call it dyspepsia too. So, you know, the dyspeptic symptoms is like a little gas, a little bloating, a little indigestion. Uh, and that is what most of the patients have problems with because, you know, Eating is such a major part of our day life. You know, it's like if you don't go in the morning, your whole day is gone. If you don't do your number one and two properly, that is a problem. So with the elderly, it, it does become a problem. And, you know, looking at the geriatric literature, um, and there is a board question because I'm trying to get recertified again. Don't ask me why, because I mainly practice gastroenterology in older patients. So that is a distinction. So the board question in ABIM, which I'm not supposed to say is, I'll say it anyway, uh, what is the best way of looking at this? And they say having a pharmacist evaluate the entire medication list with the patient. And I think this partly speaks to the U.S. Uh, practice because our appointments, believe it or not, are restricted to sometimes 15 minutes per patient. And I always have this argument with my administrators that um, in 15 minutes, they don't stop telling me what has happened to them with their last great grandchild. And, you know, then to get to them, because they're always worried about their family and what's happening to their children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, before they'll tell me, oh, by the way, I had this problem. So going through the list, if I'm doing it, which I don't have a pharmacist, I'm in a hospital based practice, I try to look at me medications that are definitely not indicated from GI perspective. If it's a cardiac medicine, I try and tell them to reach out to the cardiologist or the pulmonologist, the two major ones. And the third one is the endocrinologist, because a lot of them have hypothyroidism. So they are either taking levothyroxine, and sometimes their TSH is very low, it's very high. There's a sick youth thyroid problem that comes up in the older patients. So um, my primary care or you know medicine is not that great, but I try to do as much as I can looking at the list of medications and address it. If that okay. answers your question. Okay. And I, just a humble request to all the faculty is we are on 50 questions to cover up. And I want uh, the faculty to be ultra brief in their question the and be brief with the answer. And the uh, second question is by Dr. David. You raise your hands for a question. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I had uh, one question for each lecture, but uh, first with regard to Dr. Uh, Picciamoni's comment about respect for elders, I just wanted to assure him that, um, CS, I have respect for you uh, irrespective of age. <laughs> I, my, my geriatric question is a direct follow-up to Dr. Chaco's question. Uh, I happen to be a strong advocate, as he does, of considering medication effects as a cause of symptoms before blaming the patient for having an intrinsic disease. So I wanted to ask Dr. Chokovadia whether she would suspect alendronate as a cause of esophageal symptoms in case one, or donezepil as a contribution to the constipation in case two. 
So briefly, Dr. Sacker is actually super, super, super bright. I, I don't know how he does it in all fields. And the answer briefly is yes and yes. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, before I did, Chaco said constipation, GERD is very common among the Indians. Uh, uh, but we also found out SIBO also, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, also very common in our setup. So we need to give them antibiotic uh, locally acting and they do wonderfully well. Uh, coming to Dr. Uh, Professor Raghuram, you have a question to ask to the our uh, speaker or the other panelists. Yes, I, I, I have. You have been question. in the field for laws more than 50 years. A, a question for Dr. 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 Raghuram. Now, everybody was talking about constipation. Yeah. A lot about constipation elderly. They come with diarrhea. Okay. With yes. incontinence. And I'm happy that uh, Professor Sita stressed on the importance of rectal exam. Because if man goes for a diarrhea to general practitioner, he keeps taking a no more pills and it further aggravates the constipation. So, digitally you have to evacuate the stools and then give an enema. If you give an enema before evacuating, they will have more problems. So, what is our opinion about this? Oh, okay, the old dictum is you don't put the finger in the rectum, you put your uh, uh, feet in the grave. <laughs> Okay, you any anybody wants to ask uh, Dr. Jagannath, uh, Dr. Asok, before you come, Dr. Jagannath and another panelists want to ask question uh, about the geriatric gastroenterology. I'm just going in a round so that everyone, uh, Dr. Jagannath, then. Okay, now Dr. Uh, Asok, you want to ask some question? Yeah. Um... The question of, I think, very briefly, Dr. Sita mentioned about frailty, although she didn't mention the word. Uh, how often do you measure it in your patients, geriatric patients? And uh, do you have any specific scales for uh, different diseases or you use some simple scale? And how good it is to predict uh, morbidity and mortality? Um, so again, thank you for the question. I practice gastroenterology in an older patients. So I usually don't go towards uh, testing. I don't even do many mental state uh, status testing for uh, my patients. Uh, usually they're referred by the geriatrician and I try and refer them to a geriatrician for further testing. And mine is mostly eyeballing the patient and making sure that you know they have to get up and go and they can actually get up from the chair without using their hands or you know their muscle strength. So it's not a detailed questionnaire and or physical exam. But that is something, if we had the time, I absolutely wish we could teach ourselves and our colleagues in every specialty. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Pichamani, you want to make a comment? While you are now, making frailty, a comment... Frailty is a big problem that we don't appropriately assess, which can be assessed. Sarcopenia. Sarcopenia has become a neglected topic in geriatrics. We lose weight, but while we lose weight, we lose the muscle weight and we become frail leading to falls in the older adult. The bigger problem associated with frailty is every other neurological problem is associated with frailty. Sarcopenia can be addressed. Sarcopenia can be tested with finger grip and the muscle mass, muscle, the fat estimation, you can appropriately assess the sarcopenia that is associated with frailty. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, now we'll switch over to the pediatric so that we'll balance ourselves. And Dr. Nirmala, you want to ask any question uh, regarding uh, the, the issues related to pediatric gastric powder or you want to ask the adult gastric also. What we do mistake while referring or we don't refer at all and when do you want us to refer? Good evening to all the eminent uh, faculties. I mean, audible, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, good evening to all the eminent faculty. Uh, actually, I, first, I would like to congratulate Dr. Sita for the excellent lecture. Uh, personally, very useful. We have four uh, older adults at home. So, personally, very, very useful for us. Uh, thank you so much. And then, uh, my first, I would like to ask a question to uh, Professor Poda. Uh, as you suggested, uh, because uh, because we know we want to push the children earlier for the surgery, do you have any specific age by which you think that they should go for a surgery? or stand surgery or, or erection or any, any specific feature you look for in the child 
when they, when you think that they are suitable for the rex surgery number one number two is it is it is it difficult or easier to convince this patient these children or the parents to go for a surgery how how easy or how difficult it is nirmala you raise a pertinent issue the first thing about the age if you see there are actually if you delay the surgery then there is a progressively there will be a the compliance of the intrahepatic portal veins goes down they become more rigid more stiff even if you restore the blood supply after 10 years 15 years they will not be accommodated that amount of blood and the the shunt is going to fail so people have shown if you pick up a child less than 5 years of age then the two issues one is the chance of getting a patent left branch of the portal vein is high and secondly the shunt is going to work because their liver is not yet fibrotic their veins are compliant they will be able to accommodate the blood so what i am propagating is don't delay it. you think up front by delaying it what happened you know continuously inject sclerosin glue and some of them will retrogradely will go and block the patent vein so one day you see this splenic vein is patent after 10 session of est the splenic vein is gone you will lose the opportunity so you suggest yearly surgery is better yes and do you assess for natural shunt before undertaking surgery because those who have natural shunt then you don't have to submit them for surgery or what is the value of mr photovonograph now it is freely available those days i remember uh, dr dilavari used to inject uh, contrast into the spleen and see the lino renal natural shunts yeah. are available i remember at Dal- i think uh, dr dilavari can make a comment so do you uh, in the uh, investigative protocol you see the uh, mr photogram if yes. you see yes. natural shunts available you can avoid uh, major shunt surgery Uh, uh dr chandrasekhar you raise a pertinent issue those are the days when uh, people used to inject the uh, contrast into the spleen and to get a direct uh, splenoportovenogram nowadays we have non invasive mr venogram has become the standard of care obviously you start with doppler and go surgeon will not operate unless you do a mr venography to document the patency yes uh Uh, spontaneous shunt i am not sure the spontaneous shunt is going to be uh, uh, alleviate all this problem they don't because uh, the ehpp is different pathway the whole portal vein is blocked it's not like a cirrhosis you have the basically resistance is increased is not blocked so um, spontaneous shunt helps in probably cirrhosis but not in uh, ehpp Okay, Doctor Ashwa, quick comments. Ah, uh, uh, Ujjal, uh, excellent talk, informative. Congratulations. Thank Just you. one question to Ujjal. Uh, many years, even before sclerotherapy started in India, uh, our surgeons used to do spinorenal shunts for uh, these patients. And what we noticed is that there was a high rate of blockage of these shunts. So. if you are doing that now what is your uh, uh, present thought process do you see that so we were wondering whether because uh, we thought it was a pro coagulant uh, uh, issue and therefore the new the shunt that we were making was also getting blocked due to the same reason any thoughts on that because you said yeah. one of the processes now is rex shunt is not possible then do a uh, photo yeah. cable proximal spinal shunt uh professor uh, chakur thanks thanks for you were one of the the first few people among the adult gastroenterology who published a big series of ehp view in children uh thanks for your comment sir uh, hypercoagulant state is not a problem at all in children i showed the data there are the plenty of data from india and abroad to say that pediatric ehp view hypercoagulant state is not a problem that's why even the babino 7 does not recommend for anticoagulation use in children it is universally used in adult whether they have inherited uh, uh, procoagulant state or not. regarding the shunt surgery shunt blockage rate sir these are all actually technical issues how big is the vein how big is your uh, the uh, anastomosis that will determine the patency if you have a th- small vein king uh, anastomosis 
then they are going to develop chances of blockage is high now in general we published recently more than 200 cases of ehpb from our center and it showed that again around 10 to 15% stand blockage is they are not more than that some of the surgeons started using anticoagulation heparin followed by uh, warfarin after shan but that didn't change the picture yeah the shunt blockage is the major issue i think when i was in chandigarh as a fellow so uh, dr mitra used to do shunt surgery i assisted also while i was got <laughs> you did surgery yeah. he will make us to assist also to know how difficult the shunt surgery the mrs said then done and they do beautifully well after two weeks they get uh, blocked and that is a major issue that's the reason why it really lost the reputation then we were working on the other endotherapy at all i don't know whether any improvement there after that and uh, dr sankaran you want to make a comment please uh the topic between pediatric gastroenterologist and adel should not become a debatable one should be a little more clear cut i may probably differ from dr poder also specific indication for portal hypertension what we teach post graduates in gastroenterology number 1 hypersplenism which causes a massive splenomegaly particularly children with portal hypertension who come from rural area they are likely to play and that get injured they may come with a ruptured spleen that is why we do not advise the second thing more than 6 or 7 endotherapy fail recurrent bleeds yes severe growth failure and mother is more worried not only about the disease but also about the growth of the child we need to interfere then the next most important thing that we would like to have is suppose is the eminent surgeon professor udjal udjal potter said rex is ideal shunt the first rex shunt was done in kanji kamakoti childrens hospital as a model from rex assistant who came and first did the surgery after that i have not seen many people doing rex surgery because with due respect to pediatric surgeons rex surgery is not at all we don't have any eminent surgeon to do that these are all things which we have noticed the academic research people have been probably in lucknow yes whatever surgery that has been done for almost maximum cases in pg chandigarh by a pediatric surgeon yes there are now advances have come we do not know why we like to observe these people after pediatric age group we handed over to surgeon there is no study available what happened to these people after pediatric when we these children go back most of these hospitals if they have 12 years of age as a pediatric they don't have follow we have up to 18 years the younger the age group yes they may be having problems etc but the surgery is not at all the ideal one where we need to do it because we we have to find out the cause older children now what we found is as the child grows older when you put the child down probably some in the roll or other drug so these children may stop bleeding we are not seeing maximum bleeding after certain age yeah that is good yes i think that is a good observation i think uh, shunt surgery is the answer but the blockage is the problem and shunt surgery soon after the surgery and a sizable population significant person maybe one or two surgeon in the teaching center may be uh, successful but uh, i found most of the surgeons and the rest of the country they are not able to reproduce the same result number 1 number 2 is hypersplenism if the splenic vein is patent sometimes we do a splenic artery embolization also they do that so the big spleen can be shrunken and will be relieved of the burden of the big splenomegaly and dr sumadhi you have a comment before dr podar wants to take up the dr sumadhi yes, you sir. have a comment yes, yes. so very good evening to one and all i would like to thank chandrashekar sir for giving us the opportunity excellent lecture on both the topics on pediatrics and geriatrics and i have a question for dr ujjal sir 
Sir, what is your experience on exclusive enteral nutrition in pediatric Crohn's disease? Because many of the children are not tolerating. It is quite expensive, number one. Number two, will the rectant in future reduce the instance of portal cavernoma cholangiopathy? Because most of the children land in adult site with stones and strictures. And these are the practical difficulties where they require recurrent stent exchange. Because okay. these students, yes. I want to know. Yes. What are uh, quick answer on? The, uh, Exclusive the enteral nutrition. Uh, Sumothi, we don't have much experience. We follow the American policy of treating uh, Crohn's disease with uh, steroids rather than... See, there are two groups of people. One is European, one is American. Either you, you have to be a follower of one or two. So in, I am sitting in a ACG program, so we follow the American system. We believe in steroids. We, we don't uh, use the exclusive enteral nutrition. Not much of experience, but overall, Mild disease, mild to moderate disease of Crohn's disease, exclusive internal nutrition. You can achieve uh, remission in around 60% of cases. And there are various protocols subsequently to maintain remission as well. So yes, it is an option, however, uh, expensive. Thank Difficulty you, in maintaining compliance. Compliance issue is a big problem. Okay. The, the children will not stick to your uh, the advice diet. And that, that creates problems. And you, about the reaction, uh, mesorection, taking care of biliopathy, not much of literature because I am going to ask the same question to T.S. Okay. Sir, it is my turn to ask you. You are asking me question. Now, okay. how comfortable are you in dealing a symptomatic biliopathy a young adult has with you with biliary stricture with multiple stones? How comfortable are you? You just tell me. Yeah, yeah. Your, your question is very valid. In fact, a portal biliopathy can bleed like hell. Sometimes they come for ERCP with the stone. After retrieval of the stone, I have seen massive bleeding. Those days, we used to submit them for a various kind of interventional radiological procedure or surgery. Now, thanks to immediately, we can arrest the bleeding with the fully covered metallic stand, number one. Number two, the stitches is going to be a problem. It is ongoing. The portal pressure is increasing. That is the one of the few indications we go forward to uh, suggest surgery. We are not against surgery, number one. We are only against because the technology needs to be, it's a slow circulation yes, and there is going to be a thrombosis. Yes. And how you want to circumvent, even the best surgeon, we have seen him after two weeks, they are coming with the thrombosis and blockage and again coming to the, that is the only thing. We are not again. We, no, I, I, I fully agree. agree. We need to convince our surgeon. We need to refine our skill, everything. But you see, all the adult gastroenterologists who are sitting in the audience today, they face some time or the other this symptomatic biliopathy and how difficult it is to manage those cases. You okay, push a stain, start patient bleeding. You try to retrieve stone, patient start bleeding. You don't know what to do. You start tardy patient, noctotide, patient continuously bleeding. You call the surgeon, he refused to do an emergency stand surgery. Yeah, you so because either one the crisis that. only and uh, the permanent solution is a surgery, we know that. But uh, we still, we have not come to the stage where total uh, the results are very conducive to uh, accept as a routine procedure. That's the only thing. How it is your experience in Velud and portal hypertension surgery and the success rate? Briefly, can touch up on that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, there is very little surgery we do now mm. for portal hypertension. Uh, Except when, uh, I mean, I guess when endoscopic treatment doesn't work. So the shunt surgeries, which we had done when Dr. Prakash Kanduri used to be there, that is, uh, that really is given up. I, I think they do very little shunt surgery now. But listening to Jal, I think that's something that they should restart. I have uh, just one question for uh, Dr. Sita. Um, you know, when, uh, when you look at the IBD patients, uh, most of the IBD studies have excluded the older age group in their studies. So what is, uh, how does she approach uh, patients with IBD uh, to give biologicals? You say, are they happy to give biologicals? What are the effect of the biologicals on them? Uh, what are the side effects? Do they find any different from uh, the younger people? 
can you unmute yourself yeah 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 sita please unmute yourself and uh, this is the last question after that we are going to have a rapid fire both academic and the little lighter session uh, sita there is a question about biological in elderly for that question it's absolutely essential that you know we in the us at least approach the access to the biologics for the older patient and dr sacker is actually on this call and he is like the father of ibd if you will or the grandfather in this case uh, and he can give us a comment if he wants but uh, to keep it brief it does add, if you have any of the biologics and you use them in the indicated disease whether it's ulcerative colitis or crohn's disease older patients if they don't have contraindications such as like cardiac uh, issues you can definitely use any of them that uh, the studies are done on because you can extrapolate it however the question is about access and i mentioned very briefly pharmacoequity uh, dr anand krishnan is one of the major leaders in uh, looking at IBD in the elderly, as is Dr. Sai Katz from Long Island, and they've reported extensively on the use of these medications. They are very effective, can be used, should be used, uh, and just have to get them to the patient. Okay, thank you. Last comment, very brief comment by Dr. Ra Sankar Narayan. This is I just wanted to get an opinion from all the people. No, no. <laughs> Six <laughs> patients did very well with human. One colostrum for IBD. Very young infants, as well as older people also. They have done well. They have gained weight. There is evidence. Please let me know any experience from anybody. Do you have a place of bovine colostrum in IBD, particularly refractory IBD? Okay, that we will take up little later. Yes. The reason is that is going to right. be a very important. Now I come to the last session of the. Uh, our program, the chit chat session. I will uh, start with the uh, senior most gastrointestinal doctor, uh, Pichumani. So, had you not become a doctor, what would have become, Doctor Pichumani? Doctor Pichumani. Yes. Doctor Pichu. Yes, yes. I Go always ahead. consider myself to be a teacher in addition to be a doctor. So Actually, you would have the word doctor a... means a teacher. I would have become a teacher always. So, if you have not become a doctor, you would have become a teacher. Okay, Doctor Sita, when did you and how did you develop interest in geriatric gastroenterology? Quick answer. So, I was in my uh, I was chief of GI and I was GI chief at Joseph City Medical Center. And one of my other mentors, who's no more, Doctor Damaro, decided that geriatrics in the 1990s was an upcoming field, and he was getting old, and he thought that we should all be taking care of ourselves, and that got me to take the geriatric boards, and then. So on at Mount so Sinai. Mentor, a mentor inspired you, Doctor Ashok. What is the uh, your advice to youngsters? How to get a protected time for research and publication apart from your clinical work? You have worked in both sides. It depends on that. Depends on where you are working. If you are working in uh, in private hospitals, it is very difficult to get uh, time off because the bottom line for a private institution is to earn money. Um, so that is difficult. You mean Before, the career? Oh, okay, life. But if you're working in an academic institution, uh, depending on the institution, like in CMC, we could get time off. We could get few months off per year mm. to pursue research interests. So it depends on the institution, depends upon where you're working. Dr. Podar, what is your uh, take on work-life balance. I know you're a full-time academician. How will you manage your life and the work-life balance? Quick answer. See, uh, yes, right now there is no issue for me because I work in PGI. I'm working in SDPGI for more than 25 years and in professional job it is basically 8 o'clock to 5 or 6 o'clock. After that you have life. Your children at home, your wife at home, you keep time. You have vacation. Summer vacation, winter vacation, one month summer vacation, 10 days winter vacation. So, no difficulty. Good Probably good. after retirement, I will face this problem. Okay. So, this is the thing. Uh, Dr. Um, the, uh, Dr. Nirmala, yes, what is the non-medical book you have read recently, apart from your pediatric and gastroenterology? No, sir. I have not read anything recently. 
<laughs> not related to anything other than anybody dr pichimani you have read the book this want to know your interest quickly apart from your geriatric gastroenterology book any several other several books on history of medicine several yeah. books uh, okay history of medicine dr raguram your uh, take on non medical book you have read i am trying to learn the new languages oh what language sir hindi oh hindi is not in you <laughs> are, are you seeing uh, some hindi movies nowadays the hindi movies i think you watch uh, you know how did i learn hindi i started seeing hindi movies when i went oh, to chandigarh yes. every day for 3 months i watched all movies possible then i learned hindi dr Asim, what is the book non medical book quickly Uh, While you are answering, Sita, your book on yes, the book is I, How to Age Disgracefully by Claire Pooley. Very funny. Oh, I was waiting for that book to. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, Doctor Sankaran, and what is your take on what is non medical book? Non medical book. Yeah, yeah. Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita. Okay, right. Now tell me each one one hobbies starting from David. What is your hobby? Don't tell me that seeing the patient. Your hobby, please, Sita. Your hobby. My hobby is reading outside of medical books, like other books, like okay, aging. Okay, Padar, what is your hobby? <laughs> I didn't get opportunity to pursue my hobby. Ah, yeah, that is I... actually we have to. We all, Doctor <laughs> Chishmani, your hobby is photography. Photography. Okay, what camera you use? Right now, I am using only my iPhone camera, but I I had other cameras, single lens, reflex cameras, a few cameras. Nirmala, your hobby is? My hobby is fashion designing, sir. Oh, oh. fantastic! That oh. goes without saying that. Okay, uh, Sumati, what is your hobby? Sir, reading books. Where are you hiding? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rag Ragram, sir, what is your reading? Ragram, sir, your hobby is? The silly habit. Ah, huh? serials in the TV. Oh, watching TV. <laughs> Our uh, Ashok, your hobby is? Ma, reading. I usually fiction, <coughs> fiction, reading fiction. Oh, read, uh, reading fiction or non-fiction? Ah, uh, fiction, fiction, fiction. You are in historical or what? What you read? Ah, uh, more like uh, Jeffrey Archer or those type of. Books. Okay, that is a difficult <laughs> to read, no? Okay, <laughs> right. Now you tell me all of you how a clinician can get Nobel Prize in medicine quickly. One idea each, starting with Sita. um just follow yeah, your three four minutes more okay uh follow your passion and if you can um enlarge upon it okay podar you are uh, in uh, you are in the public I speak by passion i am a hardcore clinician by doing clinical job you can hurt i got nobel you prize you want to briefly say how a clinician can get i saw your acg 100 years of almost the legacy not even one nobel laureate there so uh, is there anything uh, This different from the mental mindset, or what do you need to add? That anyone, Nirmala, Doctor Pichuvani, you must be able to tell us. Doctor Mahalanobis, who discovered the oral rehydration therapy, according to WHO, that is the greatest discovery of the 20th century. I am not asking. Oh, okay, right. No, no, he didn't get Nobel Prize. So what no, you no, have I'm to do? I am not asking who did not get who got no, it. No, but what I am saying is identify the problem that affects the largest number of people and try to find a solution that is for fantastic. that. That is fantastic. That is that's what H Pilar is, and we are going to have Barry Marshall yeah. on uh, yeah. September 25th. Ashok, before we have yeah. three more interesting questions. No, the thing is, uh, in India, you need to change the mode of education okay. because we hardly do any research. Absolutely. Okay. Who is your favorite Bollywood or Hollywood actor, Doctor Pichamani? You can even tell actors also. Doesn't matter. Ah, uh, Shahrukh Khan. Okay, Nirmala. <laughs> Rajini Khan, sir. Ah, uh, Raghuram, sir. <laughs> I don't have any favorite actor. Okay, Doctor Ashok. Ah, uh, Shahrukh Khan. And uh, Podar. Full time, but then. And Sita. You were your Hollywood. Sean Connery, James huh? Bond. Sean Connery, James, James Bond. Bond. David, <laughs> what is that? David, <laughs> what is your? Uh, who is your favorite Hollywood actor? Okay, while you are answering, what about Shankar Ji, Shankar Narayan? And what is your answer? Who is your favorite Hollywood or Bollywood or Tamil actor actress? Uh, I don't think. Uh, 
You like okay. Shivaji Ganeshan? Nobody. Okay, right. He says, is take on. Now I want to ask every one of you to answer. What is the famous quotation you like? Starting with Dr. Pichimani. There are. It's very hard to answer. There are several quotations. No, no. Mahatma one quotation Gandhi's, is Mahatma Gandhi's quotation. What is the that? change that you want to see in the world? You be the change first. Okay, right now, good. Arvind Gubbi, what is your quotation? Arvind, and what about Pratap? What is your famous quotation? The, the best way to overcome temptation is to succumb to it. Oh, that is dangerous, no? <laughs> <laughs> and every time you succumb to that, that will be problem. So, so oh, okay, that I agree over, with. To overcome temptation. <laughs> oh, okay, right. What about Dr. Ragram, sir? The positive lab report is not the license for the physician to stop thinking further. What is that? Can you repeat it? The positive? positive lab report uh -huh. is not the license for the physician to think further. Okay, uh, okay, that is a quotation of your quotation, I think. No, okay, right. <laughs> Raju, what is your quotation? A stitch in time says nine. What is that? Ah. Ah, That's right. great. Uh, Ashok, your quotation is love your neighbor as yourself. What's that? <laughs> love, love your neighbor, neighbor as yourself. As yourself. <laughs> love yourself, huh? No, love your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> you are telling about Vanilla TV, eh? neighbors. <laughs> okay, Sita, your quotation. You seem to be reading a lot of books. No, I I had it on my slides. Youth is a gift of nature. Age is a work of art. Uh, that uh, that you already in, informed. Now uh, I want to ask something. Extempo. That is what important. Is what Dr. Pichimani said. I actually believe that you. No, should no, no. Don't repeat the same thing, please. Please, no, no. Don't repeat that. <laughs> Have fun. Whatever you do, have fun. Oh, enjoy the thing. What is Sankar Divert uh, thing? You are not updated, you are outdated. Okay, so uh -huh. that's the reason why he is attending the webinars. And the last yeah. uh, one message to delegates, uh, starting with Ashok. Message. Uh, message. Continue to watch these international webinars, webinars on, on gastroenterology. <laughs> You could have become a politician. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Padar, what is the message to delegate? So, first thing, I want to give the quotation to my, I always use to my student. Do no harm. Do, do, you can no, do, harm. That is a do, do not huh? do no harm. Okay, after long time you've told me that. Okay, <laughs> tell me what is the message to delegates? No, my message to delegate will be that these are all learning exercise. To spend this uh, one and a half hour. So the idea the why I am all this thing, you have to be really ready with the extempore answers and other things. So, this is an, an exercise. Uh, uh, so, Dr. Pichmani, what is the message to delegates? Never stop teaching. Uh, never stop learning or teaching? Learning and teaching. Okay, now you modified it. Very good. Yes, I did. So, Jairaj, <laughs> what is your uh, yeah. message to delegates? Message to delegates, uh, what? Live and let live, sir. That is what I follow. Live and let live. Arvind, your message to delegates? Okay. Who is that? Wow. Okay. Um, uh, Nirmala, what is your message to delegates? There is no substitute for hard work. Yeah. No substitute <laughs> for hard work. So, this is a quotation or a message my, to delegates? Of course, sir. <laughs> <laughs> of course, sir. My message to all the delegates is participate in all the ACG webinars without fail. <laughs> <laughs> that what Ashok said. Sir, your message to delegates? You can be an expert in medicine, but spend more time with the family also. Okay, mm -hmm. work-life balance is telling. That is a message. Now, a last question before we wind up. What is your guess in T20 World Cup? Who is going to be the winner? Who is going to be the winner? Ashok? India. India. Uh, mm -hmm. Raghuram, sir? India. And you know, India is going to play with whom? That is a very important thing. Whoever comes to the final. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> hey, okay, Qatar. Afghanistan. Oh, okay, Qatar. What is your take? World Afghanistan. Cup. Afghanistan. Afghanistan the same group. Now, how can they play with that? Oh, unless they beat the South Africa. What is your take, Nirmala? India, sir. India. Arvind, you are a very enthusiastic sportsman. What is your take? 
sir definitely india no doubt so, about uh, it no rajiv? Rajiv? Yeah. Hmm. sir and india, india government is watching this show so you have to be very careful <laughs> <laughs> rajiv what is your take who is going india. to be the winner india probably india probably why you are so uh, i mean <laughs> no because india always ponders at the la- last moment <laughs> that is the problem okay right uh, grish what is your take hmm. okay mr jairaj who is the going to be the winner so south africa let me oh, begin oh because they have failed so many times yes but they crumbled on yeah. pressure okay now we yeah. had a wonderful session yeah. and sita i must thank you very much i was wondering how you are going to cover in 30 minutes and you did a wonderful job covering the various issues in geriatric and dr podar i know i like your uh, the lectures always but uh, this is like a, a very important uh, problem what i would have uh, expe- i mean i would be expecting more uh, is where the adult gastroenterologist falter or where they need to refer to the pediatric gastroenterologist we'll have one more session on that and the excellent moderation by professor uh, pichumani and uh, dr uh, shankar narend uh, uh, pearls of wisdom he showered on and dr nirmala and sumati and dr ashok dr jagannath and dr raghuram everyone and my delegates uh, goodwill ambassadors and delegates from all over world and our academic uh, the partner uh, mr jairaj from micro lab all of you thank you very much for the wonderful opportunity and whole thing audio video setup done by my team and i must congratulate for this wonderful non without any interruption you have could manage it and we made it uh, we wanted to make it as lively as possible but never forget last for uh, thursday or uh, wednesday of every month is going to webinars like that and the september is going to be very special and we are going to have barry marshall on that thank you very much for this wonderful thank you thank you thanks